Uh, with that, we're at about uh, 10.03 Pacific time right now, 12.03. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone for joining this meeting today. Um, this has uh, been uh, a lot of years, a lot of time in coming uh, in presenting uh, the Little Trap to North America. I am the North American sales agent, um, but also uh, engineering support services manager for EnviroPod in North America. That include that means that's primarily the USA and Canada. I want to thank all of our Canadian um, registrants and folks that are that are attending from Canada on the East Coast and uh, Central Time Zone. And those of you who are from Vancouver. Uh, and uh, we're going to be covering quite a bit of ground about the litter trap today and giving you a very uh, a detailed overview uh, in this period of time, and also to really hone in on the issues that that everyone is facing right now, both in terms of municipalities uh, and uh, uh, developers, as well as regulators uh, throughout the country dealing with things like trash, debris, sediment, uh, and other gross pollutants. Uh, they either end up clogging the storm drain or creating issues downstream uh, for our watersheds and for our rivers, lakes and streams. And the good news is there is a, a solution out there. This is one of many different types of solutions, but the litter trap being one that's been proven to work quite well for gross sediment, uh, trash and debris removal. Uh, and we're going to I'm going to be showing you some examples of that uh, and give you a sense and idea how easy it really is to use a litter trap uh, in, in terms of its installation, its maintenance, and overall cost savings it provides to your maintenance services and crews out there. So with that in mind, I'll go ahead and get started uh, on the presentation. Again, uh, thank you for coming. I'm Will Harris. I'm with Clean Waters USA and Viropod Incorporated, uh, which is based out of here in California, where I'm calling from, right, where I'm talking to you from right now. Uh, the Lita Trap is not a new device. It's been around quite a number of years, but it is fairly new to North America. Uh, actually, it was introduced in Canada and then uh, recently in the last couple of years in, in California, Texas, as well as uh, in other parts of the eastern seaboard. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about EnviroPod, EnviroPod is now in its 25th year, started in 1996. You'll, you're seeing a couple of faces up here in the upper right corner. Gentleman on the left here is Mr. Mike Hanna. This is back a few years ago uh, when he had a lot more hair growing on his head. And uh, next to him, uh, we have Greg Yeoman. These are the two inventors of the Litter Trap system. And this is how the product started out in New Zealand many years ago. This is a New Zealand based company, but they have uh, offices uh, throughout uh, Aust Austral Asia as well as in uh, Canada and now with through me in North America. It's part of the Stormwater 360 Group, which is a large stormwater manufacturing and distribution company based out of New Zealand. Um, it's the leading company in the Astral Asia region for anything doing with anything to do with stormwater treatment or capturing technology. Um, we are one of the distribution partners of uh, Stormwater 360 and Viropod. Um, this slide also says there's over 30,000 installations worldwide. That has grown now to over 40,000. I'll give, show you a map in a moment where those installations are located. Uh, so in terms of uh, the types of uh, technologies, products and services that Enviropod offers, um, just some examples uh, by retention systems and certain brand names like Filterra, you might have heard of before. Um, the Stormwater 360 Group Enviroprod is a distributor for many of Contact products. For those of you who are familiar with Contact, I used to work for Contact myself. So a lot of these products you're seeing here, including on the lower right hand side, the Storm Filter. I think Jim Lenhart is on this line as well, who's the inventor of the Storm Filter. Um, this is also distributed through Enviropod uh, in New Zealand uh, and in Australia. Underground detention systems, so they have a wide variety of different technologies that they're distributors for in the Astral Asia region. But it really all started with the Litter Trap 
uh, that really began the presence of Enviropod International. Uh, give you an idea of the, the broadness of this product line and where it is currently installed. Starting on New Zealand uh, 25 years ago is where the lead trap was first installed and been moved into Australia after that, where the majority of the 40,000 or some odd number of litter traps that are currently installed in that region. Uh, in the last uh, three, four years, the Enviropod litter trap was introduced up in Canada, especially around the Great Lakes region. Uh, we do have a warehouse operation uh, out of the Toronto region, uh, primarily uh, for being able to provide municipalities and uh, private development um, uh, and industrial facility owner operators the use of the litter trap to trap everything from plastic, trash, debris, leaves, organics from getting into the Great Lakes region. And for those who are, who are joining us from Canada, I think I don't need to explain the issues that have been going ongoing in the Great Lakes region uh, for uh, plastic, debris and sediment and the amount of garbage that is getting into the lakes every year. So this is why uh, the litter trap is now available not only in the Great Lakes region, but throughout Canada. So we have installations of Luda Trap really broadly throughout uh, Canada. And now in the USA, the uh, Luda Trap was introduced to California uh, two years ago um, apply, in applying for what's called a full trash capture certification for the device through the California State Water Board. California is a rather unusual state and that it actually has a requirement for the municipalities for capturing trash debris and there is a process for technologies to be certified. The litter trap went through that certification with my help and support starting two years ago. It took some time to get that certification because it is not an easy certification process nor evaluation to go through. I can say since November of last year, uh, 2020, the litter trap is a certified full trash capture device in the state of California, which gives it a lot of credibility in terms of the um, acceptance level from other states and other municipalities, especially in California, where we're really on full trash capture. More recently, we have installations now in Texas at an industrial, industrial facility. And I'm not on the list right now, you can't see, but we do have installations and we have an installation. Installations now starting in Florida, as well as up in New York. Uh, there is some nonprofit organizations who have received grant funding. Uh, and uh, part of that grant funding was utilizing a trash capture device that would keep uh, trash and debris from getting into the local rivers that are feeding into the Great Lakes. So now we have installations up in the upper New York State area as well. A little bit about Clean Waters USA and Viropod. Uh, we are a USA-based company, but we cover all of North America uh, in, in, in assisting uh, owners, operators, municipalities, and regulators uh, with providing information and sizing, uh, product delivery, installation training. Uh, we also provide engineering support to civil engineers uh, from our offices. And uh, I've been in the industry for over 30 years. For some of you in the audience who know me, you've seen me wear a lot of different hats. I started Clean Waters USA uh, with the support of Enviropod International, really to bring the new technologies such as the, the Enviropod uh, litter trap to North America. Hello, we have uh, someone in the background with their microphone on. Would you mind turning it off for the time being? Thank you very much. With that in mind, um, this is a, a, a litter trap is probably one of the few technologies that actually offers any kind of a warranty. Um, offering the eight year warranty is probably the longest or, uh, in the industry. The reason why we back it with an eight year warranty because this is an extremely durable product. And we're talking about a product, a system that will have essentially a, a, a life cycle of approximately 20 to 25 years. Uh, that's one of that's that's something that's much longer than most other products that are out there that can take the punishment and the demand uh, for the conditions that it's laid under, whether it's in ice or it's in heat or it's in different types of uh, flood conditions, as well as uh, the amount of debris and sediment getting into it. So the eight-year warranties 
probably one of the longest in the industry. Suggestible and flexible, it's modular. Uh, that makes it very attractive for contractors and for owners to be able to simply install and maintain. Uh, also comes with different types of options, such as in California. Um, there's a requirement in California that there be no standing water uh, in any type of a device that captures um, pollutants that are conveyed in storm water runoff inside of catch basins. So we've actually developed a hinge vector port seal to allow uh, the mosquito vector control um, uh, agency representatives to be able to come in and see if there's any standing water uh, underneath the act, underneath the litter trap unit. So these are the kind of things we've we've been able to do in offering a unit that's durable and something that's easily accessible uh, for anyone to use, and no matter what agency requirement it may be. Uh, so this is actually just a, a quick snapshot of the California State Water Board approval. Um, this again occurred in, in October of last year. I said November earlier. Um, the approval with the certification was made in 2020 October with the Mosquito Vector Control Association verification in July. So for those of you in California who asked that question, is your product certified as a full trash capture device by the State Water Board? We have the evidence right here. Uh, the litter trap actually comes in four basic sizes for the most common types of catch basins, the smallest being a small 12 by 12 unit, um, and then 18 by 18, 24 by 24, 36 by 24. We can actually combine these uh, different modular sizes to meet whatever size of a catch basin it may be. For instance, if there is a 36 by 36 grade inlet type of catch basin, then we can just combine two 18 by 18 litter trap baskets that way. Um, if it's a 48 by 48, we can combine um, the 24 by 24s together. So, so whether it's no matter what the size the catch basin may be, uh, these four different sizes in combination can fit any type of catch basin. Of course, with using some additional components as the seals, you'll see some examples of that at a moment as well. This is a, a actual just a quick animation to show how the litter trap is installed inside a grade inlet type catch basin. We do use a separate bracket. Um, so that it doesn't sit on the actual grate itself or on the lip of the grate. It actually sits just under the uh, lip of the grate, so it's separately mounted. That's probably one of the major differences in why the litter trap uh, has such a long endurance, because most, cat, most catch basin filters that have to sit on the grate take a lot of punishment from the grate itself or from traffic being loaded on top of that grate, and then um, the, there's a lot of wear and tear on the lip of that grate when the catch basin is placed there. So that's why we don't actually place it right on the lip. There's one exception to that, and that's our 12 by 12 model, which we had to design with placement on the lip of the grate only because there's no way to fit it under directly underneath in a, such a small catch basin. Uh, the lidded trap does come with an internal bypass. So that way there is no possibility for water to back up and flood uh, a area or create backflows. Um, so underneath the actual frame opening, there is a two inch wide opening to allow for flows to bypass through the top. Now that doesn't create resuspension of materials to get out the bypass because water pressure coming on top of the basket and forcing that debris to stay in the basket, there's no way for that water then to drive that material back out because the pressure is going down, not sideways. So all that debris stays in the basket as it does go into bypass. Um, I'll show you some examples of that as well in our hydrology slide that we have. The components of materials, there's really three major components uh, overall for the system. It's made of a reinforced fiberglass material uh, as well as HDPE plastics and steel. So those are the three major components. We do have our specification and material specifications available for those who uh, request it. It's also part of our uh, specifications we provide to civil engineers for all the components and materials. Uh, again, these materials are, are very adequate to be able uh, to support uh, any amount of debris over time. That's why we have an eight-year warranty minimum 
for static parts and components, but overall life cycle, we're talking 20 to 25 years. And in terms of its ability to support the weight of material, you're seeing an actual uh, shot of gravel um, being placed on there. Uh, we've, we've put it through actually through a series of different um, uh, tests, low tests for the system. It can actually support up to 600 pounds per basket. That's a tremendous amount of weight. And rarely ever if we're going to see 600 pounds of material get into that basket. This is just a, a backing up what I just said on the structural testing we have performed on the system. And uh, it's withstood over time uh, 600 pounds of material sitting in this basket. And again, I doubt very much you'll ever receive it, that much material. Um, this is to make sure how far it was the breaking point would be. Um, basically, its breaking point was somewhere just a little under 600 pounds of support. With uh, the uniqueness of this product, again, we offer different types of performance liners. Now, these are liners that actually go inside the main basket of the system. These liners have different aperture sizes uh, and different microns. So, for instance, in California, the primary uh, if the primary purpose for using the litter trap is for capturing trash and debris as defined by the state water board in California, um, uh, trash and debris is defined as any particle size that's five millimeter or larger particle. That's really about the size of a cigarette butt, um, which was the intent of what that definition was about. So we actually have a five millimeter performance lighter that can be simply placed and installed inside the main basket. That liner is replaceable. It's also washable and it's reusable. We give the actual liner life cycle anywhere between five to eight years of time before you would have to replace a liner. Uh, replacing liners are, are really essentially very cost effective. We're talking about an item that costs anywhere between $30 to $50, depending on the liner. And if that's what you have to spend every Three, you know, every five to eight years. Well, I think that's probably a pretty good uh, price for just the replacing the liner. You're not having to replace the whole basket. Uh, for addressing other smaller particles like microplastics, we have a 200 micron liner, uh, which can be easily placed and installed inside uh, the basket. And then for plastic pellets, and you'll see some examples of that in this presentation as we move forward, um, there's a thousand micron uh, sized liner. Uh, so this gives a variety of different types of uh, liners we can use, really depending on uh, targeting that particular pollutant concern we're trying to address. Seal extension kits. Um, the litter trap actually comes with a set of standard seals that are about three and a half inches wide. We use the seals to cover the surrounding area around the basket. Um, you'll see an example of that during our installation slide in a moment. But seal extension kits are really there for being able to fit the litter trap in non-standard or larger types of uh, catch basins where a standard seal wouldn't be able to fit. Um, again, these are lightweight. They can be easily cut with um, a regular box knife to shape around the edges and seal around the edges of the litter trap basket inside the catch basin. Um, so for instance, if we we're talking about using uh, a litter traps inside a 48 by 48, a great inlet, then we would use two uh, what we call 9060 models, which are 24 by 36 models on each side. And then we can put an extension seal right down the center to drive that water on each side through the baskets. That way all the water is going through the actual litter trap basket itself. We also can put, I'd like to call it a square peg in a round hole. There are a lot of catch basins out there that are round manhole type catch basins, and we do have a manhole adapter in which we can take the square or rectangular type of Envirapod uh, litter trap basket, and we can use this adapter, which you can't really see too well around uh, this uh, manhole, but it does fit around this section, and then the manhole, uh, the litter trap can be then fit on the bracket slide right there, and then from there, you can actually put the seals around the edges. So we can actually place a square peg and a round hole. It can be done. We have a lot of third party performance and hydraulic testing available. For those of you who would like to see or get copies of any of our third party testing data, we're more than happy to share that with you. And one thing that we're 
pretty strongly in our policies about is we don't make claims for uh, for removal of things that we don't have data for or that we can't back up with some evidence. So you won't find Will Harris or anybody here making claims on removal of, of pollutants of concern that we haven't already tested for. Um, and one thing that we do take our projects on is the third party testing is performed in a laboratory. In this case, we do a lot of our testing up in Canada um, at a third party um, um, testing lab, which is actually certified and approved uh, by a number of different agencies for their testing. Um, and this gives you an example of what uh, materials that we're testing for, especially for different types of pollutants of concern in sediment, primarily in different sizes and particle size distribution. Uh, we've also um, had real field uh, testing performed on plastic pellet capture. Um, this is one of the major concerns. Uh, plastic pellets or nurdles, as they're called, is a big concern around the country right now in North America or actually around the world for that matter. The plastic industry has uh, been getting a black eye uh, over the last few years over the, uh, the manufacturing of nurdles escaping into waterways and um, they're doing their best at addressing them. And one of the solutions um, that we offer is the lidded trap for plastic pellet capture using that thousand micron liner uh, inside the basket. So we have real world experience, real world data, data and case studies around plastic pellet capture. Uh, we take a lot of pride in this and this is one of our missions is to really help the plastic industry with addressing this issue and mitigating plastic nurdles from getting into our waterways. This is more of a, a focus on California since uh, mosquito and vector controls is a major issue. West Nile virus is a major issue in California as it is in other parts of North America. Um, but in particular to using devices for capturing trash and debris in California, there is a requirement that that device does need to have an access port to allow mosquito vector control uh, inspectors come in and be able to look uh, and see if there's any standing water in that great inlet catch basin. Now this only applies to great inlet or drop inlet type catch basins. It doesn't apply to curb in the catch basin because there's already accessibility around the edges of a curb inlet. But for great inlets, it's hard to see for an inspector to see if there's any standing water. We've developed this rather uh, unique open hatch that right now, to my knowledge, no other manufacturer has where you can simply lift this hinge and be able to view it to see if there's any standing water. It's spring loaded, um, so it makes it very, very easy for an inspector to use that J-hook to lift up to see if there's any standing water at that time. Uh, great inlet configurations. Uh, this is some examples of what we can do in placing. Um, these are just examples for litter traps in these particular configurations. But in selecting a litter trap, uh, we always recommend taking measurements. And we do offer measurement forms for any type of a most standard type of catch basin structures that are out there. Uh, we like to have measurements because we want to be able to offer the service of recommending what would be the best size of litter trap to meet your particular needs. Now, engineers do this all the time. So we do have this type of sizing table to choose from. Uh, and um, that way, the engineer can be able to select the right uh, catch basin, a uh, litter trap unit size for that particular catch basin. Uh, and based on those measurements, or if it's a standard type catch basin, well, it's pretty easy then to just reach for that particular model um, on the actual sizing chart that we have here uh, and be able to select and choose it for specification. Uh, we do have flow rate capacities. We also have maximum trash and capture volume rate. Uh, we, we do all of our design work based on a 50% um, filled basket so that if the engineer is concerned about, well, how much flows can this litter trap handle uh, and manage? We've gone through that testing. All that test data is then applied to our sizing tables and specifications, and we have maximum uh, bypass flow rates for each one of our different sizes. So that is an important question to answer for engineers. For curb in the configurations, um, the, the litter traps is actually placed just under the throat opening as water is flowing in through the opening. Um, the litter trap bracket is placed just underneath that uh, section of the throat opening. So it captures the trash and debris 
Obviously, they all have internal bypass mechanisms to allow that water to bypass during higher peak flows. Uh, we also have a design for a combination grate curb inlet opening as well, where we have a number of installations in California uh, at, uh, at a couple of different municipalities right now. Um, and this is, makes it easy for the water to be by, as it goes through the, over the curb inlet, can be directed back into the basket and go out after treatment is done. Um, this is just a quick shot of showing how the curb inlet uh, is applied for a curb inlet model structure for the litter trap to be placed inside. And in terms of it, depending on the actual length of the curb inlet, we just keep adding more baskets and seals around the edges. So that way you have either one or more different types of uh, litter trap size baskets, uh, no matter what the length of the opening is. Um, we use the seals in combination of that size to install it inside that curb inlet. Uh, this again uh, shows some examples of the size of a three and a half wide by four foot wide curb entry, or if it's a longer five foot, five, five foot curb entry, then we have different options of using either two smaller litter trap units or one large and one small. Uh, the main thing is, is that um, you're able to get all that water directed to the baskets no matter what size there is, but giving you that option of a different smaller size or one large size means you're, it's going to be economical to use for the larger size rather than lots of different smaller sizes. We do offer the options for um, absorbent pouches uh, or booms uh, that can be placed inside the litter trap basket or simply placed around the edges of the frame. As water's flowing in, it can capture things as oil and greases. Um, the litter trap basket itself doesn't absorb oil and greases. We have to use insert pouches to do that. Um, so whether it is a uh, oil-based type of, of hydrocarbon um, that we're trying to absorb or vegetable-based, such as what's uh, generated restaurants, we have either option for either capturing oils, greases, fine sediments, uh, or hydrocarbons. When a litter trap is shipped out, it comes in a box. And depending on what size, the actual unit is, this is essentially what is found inside the box. There's bracket and anchor bolts, a filter box, seals and screws, and the litter trap basket. Uh, once you take everything out of the box, it, we have an installation manual where we've made this very, very simple for anyone to basically install the actual litter trap itself. Um, and with that also, we offer as an option free installation training, uh, doing it virtually online. Uh, I conduct that training for installation as well as our staff in our engineering department. So, sorry about that. I um, had a little, little sound coming on there, but we'll give you an installation example right now, showing you how the litter trap is installed in such as a, a great inlet. Um, the bracket is made of steel, and that's the first thing that goes on. Uh, to the little to the to the side opening of the curb inlet, um, then using uh, make, uh, masonry and anchor bolts uh, and uh, screws can simply be screwed in. It doesn't really take that much effort in installing uh, a litter trap. Uh, once the bracket is installed, and we always recommend placing the bracket a minimum of two inches uh, to eight inches below the actual lip of the grate. Uh, once that is actually installed, then you actually have your bracket that'll support the whole litter trap. This takes all but approximately anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes, depending. The first time for everything takes a little bit longer. I think we have some folks in the audience who actually have experience installing a litter trap. So I think after the first time you do this, the next one and the next one after that becomes much faster. Our crews have been able to install these units in anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes each. And we do have um, we do have field crews and companies that preferred vendors, if you will, um, in California that we can recommend uh, for installation or are very familiar with a litter trap. Um, and we're happy to provide that to you actually for contractors anywhere around the country around the country um, that are looking for installation contractors. But it really is, this is designed again for anyone to be able to install. If uh, certain municipalities have their own maintenance crews, then that's fine as well. Once the uh, bracket and frame are placed in, as you can see that they're 
their tap screwed in, then the litter trap uh, basket itself is placed in, and you can see how it's centered. Uh, you can actually be able to adjust the frame to center the litter trap in the middle of that basket, so it makes it much easier to install. We've come across a lot of different types of grate inlets and some that are not maybe originally installed properly. So, um, and by the way, if you see the word pit, that's more of a New Zealand term for catch basin. So I want to make sure that people understand, <laughs> uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the word pit, that's what they call catch basins in Australia and in New Zealand. But, but in coming across a lot of different types of catch basins, they're not all, always have been installed properly. So it doesn't really matter because we can take a litter trap and we can install them even in offset type of catch basins. Whoops. Sorry about that. Let me see if we can go back here to the screen. Can everybody see my screen okay? Jim, are you there? I can hear you well. Okay, okay. so it looks like somebody I, I had, did I lose my screen? Is everybody still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, can you see the screen? Yep. And the slide, okay, great. Great, super, I thought we lost it there for a second. Okay, so back to different types of grates, grate inlets, and also in terms of the sizes of those curb inlets and grate inlets. Um, again, this is showing examples of installations that have gone in like a large 36 by 36 grate inlet. Well, we can fit one 36 by 24 litter trap inside that uh, 36 by 36 catch basin. It's This is all it really takes for being able to trap and capture trash and debris or sediment or plastic pellets in this case uh, inside the litter trap. Um, and this all took but about close to 15 minutes for this installation to take place. Again, an example of 48 by 48 type catch basins, we use extension seals with two uh, litter trap 90, 60 units on each side. In uh, the combination type inlets, the great, uh, great curb inlet type of, of structures, we can simply take that extension seal and we can actually, you can use a box knife and you can cut it to shape so that all that water can be diverted into the litter trap, whether it's going from the curb or from the grate. There we go. Um, so let's talk about maintenance. Um, this is probably the easiest part of all. You can do this by hand or you can use my vector truck, either one. Um, it, we recommend when the basket is filled anywhere between 50 to 75 percent of debris or sediment, it's time to maintain it. And you can either maintain it by hand by, by just simply lifting it out and then tipping it, placing it into your uh, disposal receptacle, and then it's done and it's over. Or Here's an example of uh, probably the most extreme example I can show you is where this is a litter trap that wasn't maintained at all for quite some time. Uh, and you can see where there's actually a lot of standing water on top of a lot of sediment. Um, these folks um, are going to lift out roughly a 300 pound litter trap unit that's still supporting its weight and all that sediment. Um, this is not something we would recommend doing. Ignoring any type of maintenance is not a good idea. But this tells you also that what the litter trap can do under these extreme conditions and be able to retain that sediment and debris. Uh, this is up in the city of Barrie, um, where you get quite a, a lot more rainfall uh, in that particular portion, and that was at a construction and an industrial site at that time. So that gives you an example of how well the system can hold itself, uh, hold the material inside the actual litter trap basket. It's a much more uh, simpler, faster way of doing it. You can use a vector truck. Uh, vector truck and debris just using a simple hose. If you'll notice on the very front end of that rigid hose, you have a rubber coupling which allows for that uh, basket um, to be preserved. Uh, if you use something harder, it could break that basket. So we always recommend using a rubber uh, type of uh, gasket on the end. Um, but um, this takes very little time at all uh, and being able to remove all the debris. And then once the actual debris is removed out of the basket, you can simply remove the basket out and then get access 
to the sump right after that. Um, so in Canada, uh, they use uh, a lot of um, catch basins that have sumps in them. And so those sumps can then be accessed to get the additional finer particle sediments that follow the sump and be removed. And then you can simply put the litter trap basket back into place after the sump has been cleaned. So that's how maintenance, uh, that, that's how maintenance operation occurs. And again, the, the current, the regimen for maintenance in California, for instance, is a lot different than up in Canada. Uh, we recommend uh, a minimum of uh, quarterly inspections for the litter trap system. It may only need to be maintained two or three times a year under uh, conditions in the Northeast or up in Canada. In California, it may be a minimum of twice per year, once in the spring, once in the fall. Um, that's our recommendation. It also depends on the amount of pollutant loading. Um, so you have a litter trap that's located at a very, what we call hot spot, a uh, lot of garbage and debris. Um, that, that litter trap may be maintained more often compared to a litter trap that place an area where you're not getting a lot of loading and not getting a lot of rainfall. Uh, so there is, we've seen some cases where they had to come out and maintain a litter trap once every two months when there's a lot of rainfall, a lot of flooding, and a lot of debris getting into the litter trap. Um, so there isn't any particular singular one maintenance regimen for any kind of a in inlet filter device or for that matter for any stormwater treatment device. So again, but two to three times a year is pretty much been the average regimen for maintenance on these systems. Um, applications, I pretty much across the board, um, you can use a litter trap in just about any application. You can use for pretreatment upstream of bioretention systems or swales. Uh, we see a lot of uh, rain gardens that end up getting clogged quite often because they don't have any kind of a pretreatment device. Uh, the litter trap really serves that well for the longevity of a rain garden or a bioretention system. So we highly re recommend it for pretreatment and even upstream of separators or media filters. It acts as an excellent pretreatment system and allows for less maintenance on that downstream uh, treatment system. Uh, manufacturing facilities, I mentioned earlier about plastic, uh, uh, pl plastic nurdle manufacturers. Um, this is an excellent, simple, cost-effective way of using it there. Retail shopping centers, parking lots, um, food processing, processing plants, restaurants, we have them all. And so there's examples we have for each of these we're happy to share with you. Um, so there, it's pretty much across the board. We have case studies uh, for pretty much any type of facility. We especially like to work with uh, engineers who are working on school projects because we like to incorporate educational opportunities to teach students about stormwater pollution and about stormwater capture uh, and treatment. So if you have school programs or you're a designer for different school programs, we'd love to get involved as part of our educational programs um, we have for students, whether it's grade school or it's high school or junior high. So please let us know. We'd love to have that opportunity. Again, we have other case studies for logistics facilities, retail shops, um, as well as uh, all of these other different applications I mentioned earlier. Uh, vehicle dealerships, um, we're starting to see an uptick in different um, auto dealers. Obviously, with the price of cars have gone up, uh, more dealerships are now building more of expanding their facilities. Um, so we're actually working on quite a number of our vehicle dealerships right now. Um, so that's the presentation. That's the overview on the litter trap. I'm, I, this, if there's anything that I haven't answered your questions on, you're happy to ask me questions now. That's fine. If you want me to get into more detail, uh, I can actually have a separate conversation with you as well, uh, if you like, or you can send me an email. Um, but I'm going to open it up for questions now and see if I can go to the presentation uh, and uh, and see all of you if I can. Um, so uh, with that in mind, um, does anybody have any questions at all? Or anybody have you been able to answer questions on the questionnaire? OK, here we go. So from Charles Morlock, we have, can you provide the table you showed with doesn't with the device sizes? Yes, we can. Treatment flow rates, bypass flow rates, uh, and interested in a full size capture fabric, five millimeter size. Yes, we do. 
Um, as part of our um, as part of our presentation, as part of our what we provide to civil engineers uh, or municipalities, we provide the sizing table. We have that information available, not only in a spreadsheet, but actually in a PDF format. If if you send us a request, um, either online or at, or me directly by email, be happy to share that with you, as well as our specifications. Uh, we have the actual sizes and drawings for each. They are available um, for download. Um, so either you can send me an email or you can go to the envirapod.com website and we'll be happy to provide that to you. Is the basket device uh, steel? Let's see, I get this question here. Is the device basket steel with larger than five millimeter holes and then the desired filter material dropped in to get to five millimeter micron level filtration? Essentially, yes, but the, the basket itself is not made of steel. It's the only thing that's made of steel is the actually is the bracket itself that supports the actual basket. The basket itself is made of a neoprene and HTPE plastic, which holds up to 600 pounds of material. The five millimeter liner, uh, is is made of a um, should say uh, similar to oh gosh it, it's a it's not a steel material I'm trying to think of the microfiber material it's made of let me get back to you on that but it's 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 actually made of a reinforced plastic material that I can't think of the name at the moment but I'll get back to you on that and it will support and capture any particle size that's five millimeter or larger and that's what we use in our test by the way for meeting the California State Water Board verification. Uh, what parts are considered not static and not subject to warranty? Well, the liner itself, that's basically it. Um, the liner is something that would not be under the eight year warranty, though it will last anywhere, we believe, five to eight years. It depends on the amount of punishment that liner takes because the liner does take the majority of the punishment over time. So that would be considered to be not part of the static parts. I hope that answers that question. Um, I will get back to anyone regarding the actual material itself for the liner. I just couldn't think of the name of it right now. Um, but um, but yeah, are there are there any other questions or am I missing any here? Let me see if I can open up uh, the presentation for anybody who wants to speak. Let me see here for a sec. So I think everybody has their mic has their mics off. Is that correct? If you want to open up your mic, you can. So you have that ability to talk. Will, I have a question. This is Kerry Witt. Hey, Kerry. Can you hear me? Yeah. So are you finding as you're gaining approval of these um, permanent BMPs that people are specifying them by by product name or by family of products or by their uh, performance capabilities? Well, it's a little bit combination of bo both, but most municipalities steer away from, uh, and and I totally, we totally understand this, steer away from actually specifying a brand name. Um, that's, that's not kosher for most municipalities uh, due to a lot of different, uh, for a lot of reasons. In those cases, simply calling this a inlet filter or a catch basin inlet filter, we have what we call generic specifications that don't have the Litatrap or Enviroprod brand name, but it does have the performance specifications generically written in the specifications. So if a municipality wanted to specify the Litatrap, they wouldn't have to use the word Litatrap at all. Um, in other cases where it's private industry and a parking lot type of uh, of operation, we seen well it, it, there's you know engineers have no problem listing the litter trap uh and the litter trap is specified with brand name recognition on a number of different prime um, private development operations and that's fine as well it's the same specification it's the one we have generic and one that is branded so i hope that helps answer that question um, what's performance driven carry is really what the local municipality may require uh, or in terms of California, it's what's driving this these performance spec is the is the five millimeter trash and debris uh, requirement. Uh, in which case, we've met that requirement through the certification process. Um, other regions may not have that same kind of regimented 
performance requirement, but we do provide a performance spec no matter what. Um, some in industrial applications say, hey, our target political concern is going to be plastic pellets. Well, we know the majority of all plastic pellets that are out there are a thousand micron or larger, and that's why we use then a thousand micron performance spec for that particular application. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So Thank yes, great. It does. Thank you. And that's a great question, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, what is the frequency of maintenance two to three times a year or more? Um, thank you, Ethan, for asking that question. Again, that's our recommendation is two to three times a year, but that doesn't mean that's going to be the case on every single location. Um, everything is really driven um, for maintenance around what the pollutant load conditions are for that catch basin. So it may be that one catch basin might have a tremendous amount of loading going on more often than another. Um, that a catch basin may have to be maintained once every couple of months, or in another case, it may only be once a year. Um, as you know, in California, we don't get a lot of rainfall. We're in a drought, drought state right now, and with that in mind, we'll have a lot of pollutants loading up on the roadway. We'll have one major rainfall, and it drives all of those pollutants down once a year. Um, so we see that happen. Whereas the East Coast, um, you're getting more water now on the East Coast, where Maintenance may be, um, you know, two to three times a year on average, uh, but it might be less for some areas where the pollutant load is not very heavy. Uh, let's see here. Is let's see, uh, Russ Weigart. Yeah, thank you. Is fouling bio or fine debris an issue when using microplastic liner? No. If if anything, we have data to show that we actually help with um, no no fouling or resuspension of the materials. Uh, going in out of the outlet pipe. Um, and I'm happy to share that data with you, Russ. Um, but if anything, the litter trap really acts um, as, a, as a way to keep uh, the water from um, fouling or discarding through the system. And our, our data shows that reductions, it reduces the amount of fouling significantly. So no, we don't get that kind of resuspension at all. Uh, from Zion, has a device been used in catch basins along rural roads in grassy areas? Yes, it has. Uh, and uh, we're happy that's one of our, we have a case study for that available as well. So if you'd like to see that case study, be happy, send me an email. I'll be happy to provide that to you. Uh, rural roadways are definitely different than urban roadways, no doubt about it. And the pollutants concern that are going to be transporting, con conveying runoff at rural locations are going to be um, much more much more intensive around the organic side, especially with grass materials, uh, debris, sediment, um, than in uh, urban areas. So this system has been placed in every kind of condition you can think of, especially in rural areas. Uh, let's see, um, will this webinar be available on your website? Yes, it will. And we'll be sending out an email to everybody who's attending this uh, presentation. Um, you'll be getting another separate email where it will be available. That'll come from our marketing department, um, and I want to thank our marketing department for making this available um, because they have more knowledge than I do on how to make that work. Um, but yes, it will be available for sure. Um, let's see if I'm missing any other questions here. Uh, any issues with hurricanes? Whoa. Well, we don't get hurricanes out here in California. We don't get tornadoes either that right often. But um, we have not had or seen a litter trap under a condition with a hurricane where it didn't work. And again, I can't answer that question because I don't have a lot of knowledge of, of hurricanes <laughs> hitting the actual spot. You know you're going to have flooding no matter what you have in a hurricane condition. Um, this system will, will act as any other type of stormwater treatment system during a hurricane. It's going to collect the debris, store the debris, um, but depending on the intensity of the hurricane, you're going to get flooding. Well, the flooding is going to occur no matter what what happens. So um, which parts are considered nuts? OK, I answered that question. Let me see if I'm missing any other questions here. Uh, OK, so if anyone wants to have additional information, please send me an email. Uh, I have my email address up here for you. It's at will at Enviropod. Dot com. You can also go to the website uh, at uh, www.enviropod.com and download information 
uh, on the Envirapod. I'm happy to provide you the sizing tables, the installation manual, or any other case study information you may be requesting. But all of you have been asking great questions. And if there's, is there anyone else out there who would like to speak and provide a question right now or any other comment you might have? Okay, I think we pretty much have come to the end of the webinar. And again, thank you so much for joining us in this presentation. Uh, I think this uh, this is this recording will be available soon. You'll get an email on that. But feel free to, to reach out to me directly. And my phone number is on the slides as well. So um, I thank you very much for all coming. And we look forward to working with you uh, in the near future. Let us know how we can assist. Thank you very much, Will. It's Jack Brooks from the city of Mississauga. It was a very oh, great. important. Great to have you. Glad you're here, Jack. Long time no speak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be reaching out to you shortly. So Thank you. no problem. All right. I think this will be a great solution to a lot of our problems. Well, I appreciate that. And I hope I can make it up there when uh, things things slow down a little more in COVID to uh, be able to see some results of myself. Yes. So, okay. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. You have a great uh, week and coming up to the weekend. And uh, again, feel free to reach me with any questions. So long now. <laughs>